I'm not a very good live tweeter either, but I'll try to tweet out your talk at some point too, if I can. Awesome. Good morning, Connie. Good morning, Hans. Good morning. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Good morning, Thanks everyone. Me. Morning. Thank you, everyone. All right, it's eight. Let's kick it up. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the second annual Syngap Scientific Roundtable. Um, my name is Mike Grelia. I'm the managing director of SRF. We did this last year in Baltimore. The idea was to do this this year in Seattle. Um, unfortunately, we're not in Seattle, but we still have Dr. Heather Mefford from UW until she goes to St. Jude. And um, we're thrilled to be here. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you for everyone who's attending. I'm gonna keep talking quickly so I can give this over to Heather. Um, just a quick reminder, Syngap Research Fund is a patient-led, patient advocacy organization. We're obsessed with um, improving the quality of life of our kids and our loved ones through R&D treatments, therapies, and support systems. SyngapResearchFund.org to learn more. Thank you to our loan sponsor for this event. Invitae has helped us defray the costs of uh, hosting this event and sending out thousands of postcards to neurologists across America to come and join us. Um, really grateful for their support and partnership and for all the kids they've diagnosed. The run of show today is Dr. Kennedy, Dr. Heller, Dr. Rumba, Dr. Koba, tag team, Dr. George and Dr. Ahern, Dr. Smith Hicks from Hopkins, uh, Elise Brimble from Citizen, and then Hans and I will wrap it up. So it's a, it's a power packed day. And before I kick this off, in case you enjoy this, I want to tell everybody that we're going to do this. We're going to do a similar event in Spanish in February. So if we have any fluent Spanish speakers um, who want to raise their hand and volunteer to participate in this, please do. Um, part of this is to get other scientists obsessed with Syngap, but part of it is to create content for neurologists to learn about this, this disease as we keep diagnosing more kids. So hopefully this will help all of our, our colleagues in Latin America and Spain have access to the same great content that we're generating today. With that, I wanna introduce Dr. Heather Mefford, who is the MC today. After I do this, you don't have to hear from me anymore. It's all me all, um, Dr. Mefford. She's a professor of pediatrics and genetic medicine at the UW. She has um, discovered a number of genes for pediatric disease. She uses cutting edge technologies and has helped define the genetic landscape of epileptic encephalopathies with studies reporting a number of copy variants, variants and numerous novel disease causing genes. She was a co-PI for several Epi4K consortium projects and co-chairs the ClinGen Neurodevelopmental Disorder Clinics, Domain Working Group and Epilepsy Gene Curation Working Group. She's moving to St. Jude's Research Hospital in 2021 where she will continue her research as part of the Center of Pediatric Neurological Disease. And who knows, hopefully maybe she'll run some studies on Syngap1. So with that, thank you so much for doing this, Heather and it's over to you to introduce our first yeah. speaker. Great. So um, great. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for asking me to kind of help run the show today. It's been my pleasure to be a part of the board for the Syngap Research Fund. And it's been, I think, really exciting to watch how much uh, you've grown and uh, brought together families, uh, scientists, and physicians for events like this and many others that you've hosted. So kudos to you. Um, just a quick couple of notes. Um, I'll introduce each speaker before they talk. They're going to have about 20 minutes or so um, uh, to uh, give their scientific talk, and then we'll have some time for discussion and questions after each talk. So if you have questions, um, the audience, if you have questions along the way, please put them in the Q&A panel. Um, prefer that over the chat if you can uh, remember to do that, and that way we can collect the questions and I'll help um, uh, facilitate the discussion after each talk. Um, so I think that's it. And um, I'll try to monitor both the chat and the Q&A, but if you could put the questions in the Q&A, that would be great. Um, so our first speaker um, is Dr. Mary Kennedy, who is the Allen and Lenabelle Davis Professor of Biology um, at Caltech. And uh, she has spent her career researching molecular basis of neuron function. Um, and actually in 1999, co-described SYNGAP1 as a major component of the postsynaptic density. And she has um, spent her career um, studying uh, biochemical mechanisms underlying learning and memory, um, as well as control of synaptic 
neuroplasticity in postsynaptic signs in glutamatergic synapses. Um, so we're delighted to have her here today um, to speak to you, and I'm going to turn it over to her to give her talk. Okay. Thank you. Let's see if I can start this. Okay, do you see it? Yes, and we can hear you just fine. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about um, three functions of the Syngap protein. Uh, I'm a basic scientist and I, I work on individual proteins and proteins and the way they function together. Um, I'm assuming that, or I've aimed the talk at um, physicians and uh, scientists who are not uh, up, who are not necessarily protein biochemists. So. Um, I'm going in the first part of the talk. I'm going to to describe some uh, functions of Syngap that are mostly already published, and then I'm going at, toward the end. I'm going to give some uh, new information and show, give you an idea of where we're going, um, understanding uh, the function of Syngap at the at the synapse. So first, the the structural domains of the Syngap protein. Actually, I'm going to minimize. There. Um, so, oh dear, there. Um, the the C two and can you see my arrow? <laughs> can you all see my arrow? Yeah, uh, I can see it. Sorry, okay, good. <laughs> Good, <laughs> everybody was muted. Um, so the C2 and RAS gap domains um, at the uh, at an N-terminal end of the protein down regulate the activity of the small GTP binding proteins RAS and RAP. And I will uh, come back to that in a later slide. Um, the disordered domain contains regulatory phosphorylation sites. Uh, and has some additional functions, we believe, as, again, as I'll come back to a bit later on. The coiled coil domain in green here uh, is a uh, mediates formation of a trimer. So this is the, the, the domain structure of a single monomer of Syngap. And it three of them coil together to form a trimer um, when, uh, uh, when the protein is translated. And then finally, uh, the PDZ ligand down here at the end uh, binds to the postsynaptic density scaffold. Um, so when I say it binds to the scaffold, I mean that uh, it binds in the way that's shown here uh, to PSD95, which is the, the major membrane proximal scaffold at the postsynaptic site. Um, it, it associates in various ways with, uh, uh, glut the ver the, with glutamate receptors. Syngap, Syngap, PSD95 has three domains shown here in blue called PDZ domains. And the PDZ ligand at the very carboxyl tail of Syngap uh, binds to these PDZ domains. It binds to them with somewhat different affinity. It, it, it has um, most affinity for PDZ3 um, and then PDZ1 and a, a somewhat lower affinity for PDZ2. But that's the, uh, the way that Syngap is held at the postsynaptic site. At least it's part of the way that it's held at the postsynaptic site. Um, there are sites in the disordered domain that are phosphorylated by both CAM kinase 2, which as you'll see in a minute is the, the main calcium dependent enzyme. It's a protein kinase that's activated uh, when synaptic plasticity is induced. By, uh, by influx of calcium and it binds, it phosphorylates several sites, most notably the ones that are circled here. And I'll talk about the function of these phosphorylation events in a minute. We also showed that CDK5, which is more of a homeostatic kinase, it's upregulated when the neurons are relatively silent. Um, it phosphorylates two additional uh, sites down here in the disordered domain. So, one function, as I said, of Syngap is to regulate the activities of the small GTP binding proteins, RAS and RAP. And RAS and RAP in turn um, regulate through a series of enzymes, a cascade of, of enzymes, mostly protein kinases, 
they regulate the rate of movement of glutamate receptors um, onto the synaptic membrane surface and also the rate of exocytosis. So the amount of receptors on the surface uh, is a, a dynamic equilibrium between insertion into the surface and, and removal. So here is a cartoon um, of the molecular pathways that underlie um, regulation of AMPA receptor insertion. So it's, it's th this yellow represents the AMPA receptor and this uh, gray stick here represents a protein called TARP, uh, transmembrane AMPA receptor associated protein that, uh, that is part really of the AMPA receptor structure and that mediates by bi ultimately binding of uh, AMPA receptors to the scaffold at PSD95. So um, the AMPA receptors are exocytosed, they, they diffuse along the membrane freely. And then uh, at, some of them are trapped is the term that's used right at the postsynaptic site by binding directly to PSD95. And I'll uh, show that in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Um, so when, when NMDA receptors are activated to induce synaptic plasticity, calcium flows through the, the channel, binds to a small uh, calcium receptor protein called calmodulin, CAM, which activates, among other things, CAM kinase 2, which then phosphorylates Syngap. And when Syngap is phosphorylated by CAM kinase 2, it favors the inactivation of RAP uh, over the inactivation of RAS. So uh, RAS functions through a cascade uh, with central to it is a, a kinase called ERK12. Uh, that cascade um, facilitates exocytosis of AMPA receptors. RAP, in contrast, uh, activates P38 and uh, through a cascade enhances endocytosis of AMPA receptors. So when Syngap is phosphorylated by CAM kinase 2, it inactivates RAP more actively than RAS. Uh, and this we, we, has been shown uh, by others um, to uh, facilitate the insertion or the exocytosis of AMPA receptors uh, into the membrane. Um, in contrast, when the neuron is relatively silent and CDK5's uh, synthesis is upregulated, it phosphorylates Syngap. And when, when phosphorylation by CDK5 dominates, uh, Syngap more actively uh, downregulates RAS than RAP. Um, and so this causes endocytosis to dominate in the dynamic equilibrium. And down, uh, over time, downregulates the amount of AMPA receptor on the surface. So Syngap acts sort of like a rheostat in this particular function, um, changing its uh, specificity for these two molecules in such a way that it participates in tuning how much exocytosis of AMPA receptors there is and how much endocytosis there is. So um, a second more speculative function of Syngap uh, we think may be to regulate or help regulate the number of glutamate receptors that are anchored to the postsynaptic density, density via binding to the scaffold protein PSD95. And what I mean by this um, is illustrated here. Um, so on the top, you see uh, a, what, a, a synapse before or without activation of the NMDA receptor. This trapezoid here outlines in the cartoon what are meant to be uh, it, representations of the, the three PDZ domains of PSD95. So you see one, two, and three. These are the other domains of PSD95. And PSD95 exists sort of in clusters up near the membrane as, as I've cartoon in a cartoon-like way represented here. Um, in the lower part of the slide, uh, you see what happens when uh, calcium and calmodulin are, are activated through activation of the NMDA receptor, binding to CAMP kinase 2 and increasing its phosphorylation of Syngap. 
Um, I, I told you before that this changes the specificity of, of Syngat for uh, RAS and RAT, but it also, um, we showed in this, this paper, Walkup and, and Mastro et al., decreases the affinity of Syngat for the PDZ domains of PSD95. And so our hypothesis is that this uh, increases, this causes Syngap to, um, the, syn the PDZ ligand of Syngap to come off the, or, or be, have less affinity for the PDZ domains so that other molecules that bind to the PDZ domains compete better for binding. And we, uh, and some of those molecules include AMPA receptors. So we think that this helps to, to free PDZ domains for binding of AMPA receptors um, and, and trapping. Um, uh, in, in, in the postsynaptic site. This would have the effect of putting, uh, allowing more AMPA receptors at the postsynaptic site and therefore increasing the strength of the synapse. And this is one of the ways um, that synaptic plasticity occurs to store information. It's called, it's called this, the, the increase in binding of AMPA receptors, increase in amount of AMPA receptors is part of the, the uh, phenomenon called long-term potentiation, or LTP. Um, Araki and, et al. And, and in Rick Huguener's lab have a slightly different interpretation of, of um, the effect of this, this coming off of Syngap um, from PSD95. Um, they they uh, postulate that the rapid dispersion of Syngap from, uh, away from synaptic site um, uh, uh, increases the, the uh, amount of active um, RAS at the synapse um, and therefore increases exocytosis, which um, pushes AMPA receptors to bind to PSD95. This, is, this mechanism isn't, um, in, is, uh, isn't incompatible with, with our hypothesis. It's, it's just uh, one of the things that we're, look, we're, we're looking at now and others are, I'm sure. Um, is the extent to which these two different uh, behave or, or aspects of the behavior of Syngap um, are important for, for uh, regulation of synaptic plasticity. So finally, a third emerging function of Syngap um, that's related to the second function um, is, is from the point of view of um, mechanistic and structural biology at the synapse is quite exciting. And that function is to participate with PSD95 in the formation of the post, in the actual formation of the postsynaptic density scaffold. So Syngap and PSD95 uh, together in vitro um, can form a gel-like structure that is referred to as a liquid-liquid phase separation. Um, and in, in vivo, in the cell, it's believed that this kind of uh, phase separation interaction functions to concentrate certain proteins near the postsynaptic membrane. So I'm gonna show you in the next two slides, um, a couple of figures from a classic paper describing liquid-liquid phase separation that explains how this works. It's an important concept, and, um, but, but not an easy one to understand. And so I'm, I'm going to, to go over it. So Michael Rosen's lab um, at uh, um, South, Texas Southwestern Medical School, um, published a, a very important early uh, paper on phase uh, transitions in the assembly of what he called multivalent signaling proteins. Now you don't need to know anything about the, the um, exact nature or location of the proteins that I'm showing here. Uh, the one diagrammed in magenta is WASP and the WASP's role in life is to accelerate the formation of branched actin um, many of you probably know that actin is the is fibers of actin are form the uh, cytoskeleton of, of um, many cells. And so WASP catalyzes the formation of actin filaments and in particular branched actin, actin filaments. Now WASP also has um, these little square domains here that are called proline rich motifs. Um, and it has several of them, they're short, maybe five or six residues and, um, and the proline rich motifs bind to a, an adapter molecule shown here in, in blue um, and they bind to uh, SH3 domains on this, and it's, the protein is just called NCK adapter. 
Um, so, uh, the, so when that happens, WASP with its sort of stuck on adapter proteins, you can imagine floating around in the cytosol. Now, a transmembrane protein called nephrin, um, when it is phosphorylated by tyrosine phosphate, which happens through various signaling mechanisms, um, a, another domain on NCK called an SH2 domain binds to those phosphorylation sites. So the effect of this um, is to form an inter a web of relatively low affinity interaction among all of these proteins. Um, and that in, in vitro is a phase separation. What hap what this, the effect of this is to concentrate NWASP right up at the membrane. It pulls all the NWASP up into a gel-like concentrated structure right up here at the membrane. And WASP begins to then to catalyze at the membrane branched actin, which forms what's called cortical actin to strengthen the, the cellular membrane. Um, so that's the basic idea of how um, what is referred to as liquid-liquid phase separation um, regulates the assembly of signaling proteins in, and concentrates them at places where they need to be. So um, I want to show one more figure from Mike Rosen's lab because it will relate to something I'm going to show you later about Syngap. Um, when when uh, the Ro Rosen's lab made synthetic proteins that contain these different amounts of these uh, um, interaction sites that I've just shown you. Um, and they show that when you mix them together in a test tube, they form and, and you just look at them um, with phase contrast microscopy or, or differential interference contrast, you see these droplets forming. They're protein droplets. And over here on the right, you see what they look like when um, a small amount of a fluorescent protein is spiked into these droplets. So the droplets really concentrate the protein. Um, and I sh showed you this slide mainly because I wanted to uh, talk about this, this um, uh, time uh, following the, the interaction of two droplets over time. You see here two droplets, one small, one large. And over time, the two droplets actually fuse together uh, to form a little bit larger droplet. So what this illustrates is the liquid-like behavior of these protein droplets. So within the, the uh, droplets, the proteins are quite mobile, um, but they stay near each other, which is why they form droplets. Um, and as two droplets interact, they begin to in, in their uh, dynamic equilibrium, they begin to interact across droplets and eventually fuse. So that's the behavior in vitro of proteins that undergo this kind of phase separation. So Minji Zhang's lab in Hong Kong showed a few years ago that two fragments of Syngap and PSD95, which I've shown you earlier, um, undergo a phase separation in vitro when they're mixed together um, and in, in this case at a concentration on the order of 50 to 100 micromolar each. Um, and so uh, in this paper by Zing et al, they actually use this piece of Syngap, um, which is just a small proportion of the protein, but it is a trimer. And so there are three PDZ ligands in this little trimer. Um, and they mixed it with the carboxyl half of PSD95 and they found that, that it undergoes a phase separation at these concentrations. We were curious to know what would happen um, if we looked at a, the, a much larger portion of the protein and we're, we, we were able, we have been able to purify um, a much longer version of Syngap uh, that contains all of these functional domains. It's just missing a piece at the end terminus. And uh, PSD95 is actually pretty easy to express um, uh, recombinantly. And so we've shown that when we mix these two proteins together, um, they undergo a phase separation quite readily at a concentration as low as two micromolar each. Um, this is much closer to a physiological concentration. Um, it, it's easy to imagine that the, these proteins reach a concentration of two micromolar in the region of the, the uh, postsynaptic site. Um, so uh, one of the things that this reduced, this lower concentration tells us is that there are additional 
interaction sites, either between Syngap and itself or between Syngap and PSD95, in addition to the interaction of the PDZ ligand with PSD95. Um, Rosen showed that what causes uh, phase separation at lower concentration is the, is the valence of the interaction of the proteins. In other words, more interaction sites cause the phase separation to happen at a lower concentration. So something more is going on here um, between Syngap and PSD95 uh, out here in these other domains. Um, so I'm gonna show you what in, in our lab, we've, we've shown what this phase separation looks like in a microscope. We've done more than just the microscope studies, but I'll show you this because they're uh, interesting to see, I think. So at about two minutes, you see these formation of some small isolated droplets of about this size. After about 15 minutes, you start to see lots of these droplets getting a little more concentrated. And after about two hours, the droplets have coalesced into these very big structures, um, droplets under the microscope. They're so big, the, the biggest part of them, the biggest droplets um, are sort of trapped under the uh, um, cover slip and, and they stop moving. If you look closely, you can see that there are little droplets fusing here with the bigger droplets as they contact them and fuse, just like I showed you in the slide from um, that early Rosen paper. Um, so that's what in vitro, the phase separation between Syngap and PS and P full length PSD95 and Syngap looks like. Um, now, we, we would like About to- five minutes, Mary. About what? five minutes. Okay, I'm almost done, good. Um, so during the uh, three months that we were unable to get into the lab, um, we decided to, to, to do something I'd wanted to do for a while. We looked at the extent of um, identities between the Syngap protein sequence among different species. So since the, the, the genome projects and since DNA sequencing has become much cheaper, um, many, many the, uh, genomes of different species have been um, isolated and you can find and predict uh, in them um, genes that are orthologous or homologous um, among different species. So we collected a whole bunch of these and we found somewhat to our surprise when we uh, aligned these sequences that um, Syngap, uh, predicted Syngap proteins are 98 to 99% conserved among 132 different mammalian sequences that we aligned. And this excludes the splice dens, which take much, uh, uh, Syngap, I should say, I didn't say this earlier, many of you probably know this. Um, Syngap exists in three different, at least three or four different um, isoforms um, because it's alternatively spliced out at the carboxyl end. And we haven't yet looked at the alignment of these because it's, it simply takes more time. Um, Amazingly enough, Syngap is also 70% conserved. And when I say conserved, I mean identical between uh, mammals, birds, and mammals and fishes, mammals and reptiles, and mammals and amphibians even. So it's a very highly identically conserved protein, which means that many parts of the, of the protein have very specific functions that can't vary over evolution without damaging the, reproduce, the reproductive capacity of the organism. Um, and, and one example is that the sequences of Syngap from the Norway rat, this is the alpha-1 isoform, which has the PDZ ligand. The sequences from the Norway rat and the common house lizard are 75% identical. So, um, and the disorder domains uh, between them are 66% 60, 66 identical between the two of them. So on my final slide, I'm just going to show you what a, uh, such a comparison one way of, of showing what, uh, what such a comparison looks like. I, I made this alignment in a program called Genius. Um, so here you see the direct comparison of the amino acid sequences of the Norway rat and the house lizard, where you see color are identical amino acids. And then um, between the two, so the, the, the sequence goes like this, and then this, and then this, and then this. Um, and the green bars show the location of identities between the two um, sequences uh, it, uh, as you go along the sequence. So what I wanna point out mostly 
is the identities in this disordered domain that's, that's marked here in magenta. So along here, you see that 60%, 66% identity of various sites in the disordered domain. So what this means is that there are many functional domains in SYNGAP that we don't yet know about or understand. These uh, identities would not be conserved through evolution if they weren't really important um, for the function of the protein. And we suspect that, uh, particularly in the disordered domain, that some of these sites may be sites where either SYNGAP interacts with itself or, or has additional interactions with PSD95, or frankly, in vivo with other proteins to pull into this phase separation, um, which concentrates proteins near the postsynaptic density. So it's uh, uh, one of the things that we're, we are going to try to do is model these interactions to see if we can predict how they will act in vivo. That's another story altogether but also identify which of these sites are important for the phase separation. So um, this is a, underneath here is a cartoon that I made of the, the I guess I should show the formation of this phase separation up near the membrane. It's just a cartoon. And I want to acknowledge Tara Mastro, um, a postdoc in my lab who did much of this work and also Ward Walkup who did the, the uh, work identifying the, the effect of phosphorylation of, um, SYNGAP on its various functions, and also Rachel Nieto, Elizabeth Bouchong, and the Caltech Mass Spec Facility, and the Caltech Imaging Facility. Um, and this work was funded by uh, NIMH, NIDA, um, and NSF. And with that, I'll stop. So are there questions? Great. Thank you so <laughs> much, Mary. That was, uh, that was great. Um, I sure learned a lot. We have uh, so far one question. I think we have time for one or two questions um, before we move on. So uh, we have one question. Do you think PSD95 and SYNGAP also phase separate in vivo? And if so, under what conditions? Um, yeah, so the, the, the term phase separation is sort of a biophysical term. Um, and this, this actually does sort of confuse people. So the answer is yes and no. We definitely think that the interactions that, that in, vit in vitro form a phase separation occur in vivo. And in vivo, as you can kind of see in this cartoon, they have the effect of forming the gel-like structure up here near the membrane. Um, and they concentrate SYNGAP and PSD95 together near the, the receptors, but also there are other proteins that need to be concentrated to, for the function of, the, of synaptic plasticity near the membrane. And we think that both PSD95 and SYNGAP have binding sites along them for uh, these other proteins so that the gel-like structure that's formed specifically near the membrane between uh, SYNGAP and PSD95, um, uh, does form in vitro and um, functions to help form uh, the postsynaptic density, which I should say at some point becomes much less, becomes uh, sort of hardened and is, is uh, uh, tightly enough formed that it survives um, breaking up the cell in isolation when we isolate something called the postsynaptic density fraction. So I hope that that helps. So, so the answer basically is yes, we think they phase separate, but under it's much more controlled than in a test tube, obviously, because there's fewer proteins and there are other proteins that, that participate. Okay, so, I, so Janie Great. Reed, in your work, do you see any role for SYNGAP monomers? Do you think they exist or are stable? Most of the patient pathogenic variants are premature truncations and wouldn't have the coiled coil domain. Um, in in a, a normal, organism, I would suspect that SYNGAP monomers don't exist because the coiled-coil interaction, or at least don't exist at any reasonable concentration, the coiled-coil interaction um, is extremely stable. Um, uh, and, and you really have to denature the protein in vitro to get them apart. Um, the, the, the notion, oh, just, the notion that um, the, um, 
sorry, I got distracted by someone at my door. The notion that the, uh, um, the, the truncations that are formed by, uh, by the aberrant um, stop codons, the, the idea is that they are probably detected by the cell as abnormal and just degraded. So I think there isn't likely to be a, a function of monomers um, or the existence of monomers, but that's, these are just guesses from what we know about the structure. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Mary. That was wonderful. I think we will move on to our next speaker. Okay, so I'll stop my share. Yes, thank you. And I'll deal with the person.